Good morning, everybody. We might get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody along to this morning's session on the future of the digital workplace. My name is James Milne. I'm the CTO and founder of Myriad Technologies, and I'm joined here today with Graham Lodge and Nathan Pierce. And what we'd like to do is walk you guys through some of the new innovations that we've seen released over the last 12 months and how this is impacting us in the workplace of the future and some of the new opportunities that we are hoping that you guys might be interested in taking advantage of. So for those people who aren't familiar with Myriad Technologies, we are a strategic technology partner uh, with Microsoft. We do have various capabilities in the process automation space with Nintex, and we can also deploy into the secure data center within Canberra. In today's session, I'd like to walk you guys through an overview of some of the enhancements of Microsoft Teams and how artificial intelligence can play a critical role in the modern workplace. We also want to visit VR and AR and how these new technologies can be used in the workplace to uh, augment some of the capabilities in our workplace. And then we'll bring it back to how we can use this to manage our documents. So looking at the current challenges in our workplace, the new normal that we're all currently experiencing uh, has presented us with a number of challenges, especially around travel. There's no longer any international or domestic travel. Remote working has become the, 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 the norm these days. And with border shutdowns, um, we're still finding it difficult to collaborate, but we'll discuss some of the new enhancements that we have with Microsoft Teams and how these might change the way we work day to day. Another one of the challenges that we're seeing in the workplace today is managing the sheer volume of content that's being produced. One of the other downsides that we're starting to see with everybody moving to the cloud is storage is pretty cheap. So we're seeing a lot of people use things like Azure storage or other cloud storage mechanisms just to hoard heaps of data. But the problem there is how do you make sense of it? We're also starting to see different types of content come through into the corporate environment. So things like 3D models, 3D videos, and we want to explore some of the opportunities that we have for presenting that content. The other major challenge we're seeing in the, the workplace is around stand downs and cut, uh, cost cuttings. A lot of organizations are starting to see process automation as imperative, where traditionally we've seen it as a luxury or a project that we should think about. But now we're seeing a big shift to process automation being key to the survival of any business. So with that, I'd like to pass over to my colleague, Graham to talk about some of the innovations that he's seeing in the space with Microsoft Teams. Thanks, James. Uh, so just while I get this ready, if we're going to be talking about Teams. So what I'm going to be talking about is Teams as a uh, as it is out of the box, essentially. So Teams has come a long way from where it used to be, um, even during the COVID times. Um, so where we're going to focus on is, is what Teams can do, where it's changed over the last few months in particular and where it's going. So the first question I get nearly all the time is, isn't Teams just Skype? Teams has replaced Skype. The answer is yes, it has. Um, but to say that that's all it is, is really limiting. Skype was a video conferencing platform, had a little bit of messaging built around it. Teams has absorbed all of that, taken it to another level and then built it on top of SharePoint. So what we have now is a fully collaborative platform. You know, something that can be used to run projects, not just hold a meeting, but to, to interact, to share content, to keep data, to keep relevant information to a group or a team and, and group it all together. Um, I've seen teams um, used quite effectively to run, as I said, project meetings and board meetings. Uh, I've seen it used to deliver a, a global AGM, so the ability to uh, bring in people from all around the world and into a a, a platform where content can be shared, interacted with, the data is recorded, all the attendance is recorded, and all this automation and stuff is built into the, the, the core of Teams. Um, so just taking a couple of steps back, it's built on top of SharePoint. So it has all those underlying features that 
Mike's I spent a lot of time and effort on getting right and, and was becoming a very core product in the workplace. And this has just really taken it to another level. Um, teams being that sort of superimposed layer of, of automation and simplicity. So what's happened with teams over the last few months, especially with COVID? So there's been a massive uptake, obviously. Um, if we talk about uh, the, some of the stats I've got here, we got daily meetings back in April passed over 75 million daily active users globally, 200 million daily meeting participants, 4.1 million daily minutes. So there's phenomenal numbers on a platform, but what you look at is a growth rate. So when COVID hit, there's a graph down there going from February through to June. All the collaborative platforms, you know, uh, Zoom and WebEx and uh, Teams and even good old Skype still got a bit of a kick along, all took a big jump during COVID as everyone scrambled to work from home, find ways to communicate and collaborate. Zoom got a jump off the mark. It was, it was socially acceptable. It was in the, you know, people were already using it at home and had some really cool social features. You could see a lot more people on the screen versus the team's little old four squares. That was all you could get at the time. But over time, the professionalism, the security, and more importantly, the feature enrichment of Teams allowed Teams to surpass Zoom back in June. And it's just continued to shoot past then. Uh, back in April, I think it passed it, and then it's just kept going up from there. So it grew over nearly 900% um, over that time. And it's just a phenomenal uptake in, in any platform, let alone you know, a collaborative platform such as this. And a lot of the driver for that were these new features that, that allowed it to compete with the likes of Zoom and all these other social platforms that had a, an initial kick along based on reputation. But once people got into them or started digging under the covers, there just wasn't enough meat in them to um, deliver for a business. So let's talk about some of the recent and upcoming features. Thing, things that So these are all features that have either just been released in the last part, few months or, or, or scheduled to be released before the end of the year. So this is a lot of content in, in a short period of time that's all come to fruition effectively since COVID started. A lot of it was already on the drawing board. Some of it's been brought forward but it's really the core of what Microsoft are doing in, in enhancing this Teams platform that underlying was already very strong. And now a lot of these surface features are coming out to make it much more capable and usable. So on the meeting experience side, there's a whole heap of features around the experience, spotlight mode, together mode, and large gallery view. The spotlight mode is a simple pin type feature where whoever your primary speaker is gets pinned and you know you can't go and change that. You, you know, whoever has the meeting has the meeting and has the floor and, and commands all the attention. Uh, together mode, I'll touch on that a little bit later, using a bit of AI to create some unique views and, and try and find more ways to get people immersed into meetings. Uh, and large gallery view. So like I said before, Teams started with four people on the screen, while Zoom and others had 20 and 30 users. Well, by the end of the year, Teams are scheduled to have up to 49 on the screen. Um, whether it hits that globally, you know, it'll be a phased rollout, but that, that's on the drawing board now. There, there are demos out there now of 49 screens on there, and that's something that's, that's well and truly on its way. Uh, we've got call merging and PSTN merging. So if you've got uh, PSTN dialing built into your uh, Teams platform, which is 100% uh, capable now, you can run it as a full PBX system if that's what you want to do. You can now merge calls, merge different one-on-one -on -one meetings, merge a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a group meeting. You could have a client on a phone call through Teams and then merge in a, a, a you know, a colleague to come into the conversation via Teams and do that all through simplicity. None of this, hang on, hang up, I'll call you back or can you join this meeting? Just hold on, I'll bring someone else in. That's out of the box. Um, and these are all the features coming in. Pop out chat and meetings, I'll touch on that one again. But for me, that's a really simple but really effective tool that I've used a lot. Um, and then in the meeting space, you've got meeting notes and things like that coming up. So what meeting notes is, we've always had documents and things in Teams. So you can have a, a Word document or a OneNote. Uh, maybe you've got a, a SharePoint site with some content on it. Meeting Notes takes that we already have got and turns it into a tab. So it makes it easier to use. So it's for the lay user, they can just click on the meeting notes and start taking notes and they're recorded and they're kept in the meeting. Live captions, simple voice to text. Um, so places where it might be noisy, you can't hear, maybe you have to take that meeting on the train on the way home, you can't really hear what's going on. You can turn on the live captions and and still see the content and read the words. Same technology can be turned into a live transcript. At the end of a meeting, if it's been enabled, you can get a full transcript of who said what and when. No more arguments over who said what. It's all there in writing and, and recorded and, and timed and no one has to scribe it. It's all there. Uh, live reactions, more of a social feature coming out. Um, you know, 
the old uh, love like and all those sorts of things. So if someone says something you like, you can hit it. If someone says you don't like, you can hit the grumpy face and all those things. Those, these are other live things and they're all animated. So again, just to find more ways to immerse people into meetings and, and into the platform. And video filters is a step forward from the backgrounds like I'm using now to using some basic AI to filter images, to enhance, improve lighting, uh, improve quality of images. And on the other side, so they're all meeting experiences, but there's been a whole host of applications and platform enhancements around automation that, that take teams beyond that meeting platform. So we're talking things like shifts, it's been out for a while, ability to track uh, people's shifts, allow users to log in, accept and turn down shifts and clock in and clock off and a few other bits and pieces. Lists, I'm gonna to touch on that one in a minute. That's taking the, the list functionality out of SharePoint up into Teams. Tasks replaces the old to-do. Really, it's an extension of the list functionality, but pre-built and, and bundled into a package that can be leveraged straight out of the box with minimal configuration. Uh, there's, with all these things, there's increased integration with the Power Platform, so Power Apps, Flow, and those sorts of things. So, you know, working with a partner like Myriad, you can extend the capabilities of things to do so much more than what they do out of the box, put um, capability on the back, be able to interact with any other parts of the 365 platform, whether it be SharePoint, um, storage, whatever it may be. There's all sorts of things you can work off the back of that. Uh, templates, been around for a little while, but in SharePoint, very common. Now they're 100% available in Teams, deployable by the end user. There's a whole heap of Microsoft to release themselves. But again, you can leverage partners like Myriad to come and build templates for your needs. So you might have a specific need for an EPC project or a, you know, a particular meeting site team you want put together. We can build templates and things around those that allow you to automate and make these things more flexible. Uh, there's another app coming out called Reflect. It's a basic polling app. Uh, there's an image there that I think shows a little how do you feel today type thing. Could be used to you know, test the response to a uh, maybe there's been a company announcement, maybe something else is going on. Um, you can use it to uh, potentially do a live poll in a meeting. There's all sorts of scenarios where it could be applied. And, and the last one I'll quickly touch on is whiteboard. So I oh, personally, I've used whiteboard a fair bit and found it quite effective. The new one that uh, I haven't actually had a chance to use a lot yet, but I'm seeing a lot more opportunity for is the content camera side of it. So taking the, the old school whiteboard, you don't have to move to a digital whiteboard. You might have that old whiteboard or that bit of paper on the wall you still want to work on, but you don't want to leave the people out. The content camera allows you to snap that image, bring it forward, and there's the image that we've got there. There's someone who's walked in front of the whiteboard. The, the application is superimposed to text so that everything's always visible as Obviously, what's being written can't be seen, but as they step out of the way, that image will update and then be brought forward again. So it allows that always live interaction. People not in the office aren't, you know, obstructed by that view. They don't have to, you know, they haven't got the luxury of bending to look around the person. They just can see the text there. So these features are making teams so much more powerful in the business place. So just go through a couple of those in a tiny bit more detail. So lists, as I've said before, teams, uh, SharePoint already had lists. Automation in lists has been around for a while. You could link them into Teams. You could create a SharePoint link, link a SharePoint site and get to some of that old content. Now you can build them directly inside Teams. You can have people come in and do it. You can enable your frontline workers to create a list on the fly, maybe a, a parts list of something that's going on. Maybe there's a project and they want to put an action list in, excuse me, in there and and then potentially build some flow and, and stuff off the back of it to do some you know, trigger activities and things moving forward. So now this is a native part of Teams and all these things are stuff that exist in the platform but have now been surfaced up into simple apps. Uh, I talked about the views before, the two I've got here are together mode and dynamic stage. So together mode, like I said before, is a an AI type feature where it brings everyone into a, a view. The, the intent is to try and feel you more immersed and engaged in conversation. Uh, there's various backgrounds. I've seen ones with a coffee shop. I've seen ones with a basketball stadium. There's all sorts of ways you can do. And I'm sure over time, it'll become more realistic and more interactive. Um, but it's just a highlight of where this technology is going, where the opportunity lies. And dynamic stage is really just culminating all these things together, the ability to be your own producer, to say, what view works for me? Oh, I want to see everyone, or I just want the content to stay still on the side, but I want to see these people, or, or I want to see the reactions of these people, so I want them left fixed on the screen. So it just gives that dynamic view for you to stage the content that you want to, how you want to stage it. So we've talked about meetings, we've talked about the office, how Teams works. Let's take it outside the office. What happens next? So obviously mobile phones, uh, a lot of people are already using Teams. Now you can take a Teams call on your phone. You can 
um, you know, jump on chats. I use mine on, all the time. I'll often transition from a laptop to phone to continue a call in the car. Uh, or maybe I'll initial, I'll accept the call in the car and then I'll get back to the office and jump out and, and rejoin on my laptop. So mobility is a key thing, laptops and everything else. But in the middle there, there's a, that little helmet there. So that's a, a real wear setup. Um, and I'll touch on that in a second. But what we're talking about there is the ability to take teams away from your, let's call them the office and technical users and out into the field into your frontline workers. So these are the people who are uh, uh, working in the field, it could be in a workshop, could be out in a, um, a mine site or an industrial site, uh, warehouse using it, pick and pay. There's all sorts of features that can be leveraged with this augmented reality. And, and James and um, Nathan will talk about some of this later on, but there's a lot of capability now in this space that really takes the platform to another level. And there's opportunities in your business to look at this and see how it can apply to you. So let's talk about the real wear as an example. So this is one, there is HoloLens and a whole heap of others. That the main reason we're talking about this real wear one is this is now out of the box, in the field, working as we, as it is here in this image. So there I've got a simple image of uh, someone wearing this setup. It's fully compatible with PPE, it's compatible with all the safety equipment. It's hands-free, so if you need to be wearing safety gloves and all those sorts of things, you're not sitting there with gloves trying to work a tablet. It's 100% hands-off. In this scenario, we've got someone connected to a Teams call working through a um, you know, technical solution, in troubleshooting, whatever it may be, with a subject matter expert on the other end. They can see exactly what the other person's seeing. The person on the, on the ground can actually take photos and video. They can actually flick up messages from the person so the person can send through a task list or something like that, potentially open up a Teams list. There's all sorts of opportunities in these sort of frontline worker scenarios. So, and, and it really is a limitless scenario. It's, there's certain things out of the box, but it really is open for your imagination as to how can this apply in your business. Uh, just quickly on the right, there's a picture of the screen there that looks tiny in the bottom right hand corner there. The reality is that view is equivalent of a seven inch tablet. So think of a large phone or a small tablet. That's the size view you've got. 100% voice driven, noise cancelling. I think it's 100 decibels of sound. It's um, you know, the screen's non-reflective, so you can use it in bright sunlight. Uh, the cameras can be used to um, take photos and video, but it can also be used as a barcode scanner, a whole host of different applications to trigger off workflows or maybe to do some stock take and, and uh, data collection, whatever it may be. So what we're saying here is Teams is not just a meeting platform. It's not just a collaboration platform. It's now a fully immersive platform that can be leveraged from the office all the way through to the frontline worker. So with that all in perspective, I'd like to pass over to Nathan, who's gonna take us through um, some of the more of the collaboration process and, and how we can leverage this power moving forward. So thank you and off to you, Nathan. Thanks for Thanks that, Grant. That, Grant. So, so what I'd like to walk you through is a brief example of how um, we can start to bring some of those out of the box features together for a live or a specific business scenario. Um, so again, we're using all out of the box 365 technology, all displayed through Teams across both a, a desk worker and then showing how we can start to bring field workers into a specific process as well. In this demonstration, we'll be showing you how you can start to bring complex business processes into your Teams environment so employees can collaborate and engage with them all through the same application. For this scenario, I'll be working within our health and safety team and running through our incident reporting process. Now, you'll notice it looks like a normal team. We've got different messages popping up in the chat. But the first thing I want to draw your attention to is we have some additional tabs across the top of our team here. Now, given we'll be talking and walking through a specific process, the first thing that I want to show you is we've added the high level process overview for our incident reporting process into the team. So anyone can come and see at a glance what the high level process is as we review, investigate, action and report incidents. Now for this scenario, we have a field worker out in the field who's captured an incident via the Power Apps, um, our Power Apps app, and has raised it. 
you'll see here that we have a bot and using some of the new features of Power Apps and Teams, it's instantly created a post inside our team for someone to go and look at. Now, first thing I can do is I can open up and view the report to get a quick glance of what's been captured out in the field. So in this, insta in this instance, there's been a machinery fire. It's in Brisbane. You also notice I've got the time, the incident type, description, explanation. And we can also start to capture things like photos and other attachments as needed as well. Now, popping back into my team, the first thing I'm going to do is I might want to know who is the health and safety officer for Brisbane. Now, I'll come back to that in just a moment. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this incident into review. Now, what the app and the process is doing is it knows who I am signed in as, Dean Andrews, and it's going to allocate that incident to myself. Coming back up to our tabs here, I'm now going to open up our incident register. Now, what we're using here is we've built a, an incident reporting dashboard using Power Apps. You'll notice there's a number of different tiles all aligned to the different stages or phases of our business process. So review, investigate, action, report, closure and escalation. And the numbers on each tile show how many different incidents are sitting in that particular phase. You'll also see we've added some additional information tiles to the app. So the total time lost in hours, the days since the last incident, given we've just raised one, it's zero and then the FAI and the MTI total. Now, if I come down to our review tab, you'll notice down the bottom here that my latest incident is sitting in the review phase. Clicking on the item, you'll see it pop up and I can review the detail behind it within the app itself. Now, for this particular one, you'll notice that we're adding some additional buttons here. So we've added, is there, was there lost time loss due to this? And for this one, I'm just going to go, yes, we lost 10 hours. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to pop this one into the investigate phase as well. Now, saving that away and popping back to my dashboard, you'll notice that this incident has removed itself. It's dropped off the review phase and has dropped into the investigate phase. Opening up my investigate phase, you'll see my task is here. So we've started to move this incident through the business process or within the Teams UI. Now, if I open up this incident, you'll see in our investigate phase, I'm presented with much the same UI, but there's some additional actions based on how our business process operates. Down the bottom here, I've got my corrective actions buttons. And from here, I can go ahead and start to add any corrective actions that might be needed. So my first corrective action is going to be investigate employee. And I'm going to go ahead and assign that to Alan. For my second action, I'm going to go ahead and say we need to investigate the machine and I'm actually going to assign that to Dean Andrews. Now saving that away, notice it's still sat in the investigate phase as we're now off beginning our investigation and I'll drop back into my into my chat. Now you might have seen before a notification pop up from Sarah um, responding to my earlier message. What we've wired up here in the background is something we're calling the Sarah bot. And just using some simple AI, we're able to have the system recognize certain posts or questions that are posted within the team and automatically respond to them. So in this instance, after I've asked who is the health and safety officer, the Sarah bot's gone off to our corporate directory and worked out that we're looking for the health and safety officer for Brisbane. And according to our official register, 
it's James and I can contact him on his mobile number listed below. Moving on within our demo, now that I've started to raise some corrective actions and still within my team, I can pop over to my corrective actions tab, which is where we've, we're using Planner to capture all of those actions and allocate them to the correct people with due dates. Now I can open up any of these actions. You'll see I've got some additional information that I can add. So I can say, you know, the machine investigation has started. I can add additional items to the checklist, track down machine code and build that out as needed. I can add additional items to the checklist and build this out as needed. Finally, once I've completed this task, I can mark it as complete and it will remove itself from our to-do list. Now, one of the final stages of our incident reporting process is the reporting piece. You notice I've got another tab here, which is our health and safety report. And what we're using here is Power BI hooked up to all of the data that we're capturing via the app and via the process as well to generate some dy a dynamic report for people to interrogate and investigate as needed or based on compliance or reporting timeframes, take a snapshot to push up to the relevant committees. Now, being Power BI, it is still a fully dynamic report. So clicking on the different filters or pie charts, you'll notice that the report itself is updating dynamically. So I can see from our reported incidents, how much time has been lost, the total number of incidents, our FAI and MTI totals. Within Power BI, this can be presented out in a number of different ways. So pie charts, simple numbers um, or bar graphs as well. All right, all now, right. Now, now on to the next topic. Next topic to talk about about next topic is next some is the some AI of the AI capabilities and two in two um, Microsoft Microsoft platforms. So so give me one give me one moment I swap over my screens. All right. So first talking about AI. Um, what I want to talk about first is what we're seeing as the, the general entry point into using AI in the business or in most um, businesses, which is people starting to look at how could they use AI to manage their business data. So with the advent of things like Azure Storage and how cheap it is, what we're starting and people starting to move large amounts of data there, we're starting to see a bit of a repeat of sins of the past where it can just become another dumping ground or as we've the term we've used before is piles of files. So the initial use case and entry point that we've seen for a lot of people is looking at how AI can start to sort those files, provide some structure or organization around them, and begin to build out different taxonomies, whether it's organizational, department, unit, projects, suppliers, customers, or even functional as well. Now, a little while ago, Microsoft actually put together a demo um, using their AI based on the JFK files. So for those of you who don't know, um, a while ago there were batches of files, so about 34,000 files released in each batch, four batches in total, so 136,000 documents that were all handwritten, they were scanned, they were photographs and in multiple languages. Microsoft loaded that um, and into their A or using a number of their AI engines, loaded that in and made it all searchable um, and discoverable using a number of the different AI um, algorithms that they have, which I'll be able to show you in a moment. Now, we started investigating this with one of our customers um, and to show them how easy it can be, we put together our own specific use case or case study using a different set of documents, um, all focused around lessons learned. So what I'll do is rather than sitting in slides, I'll jump directly into my demo environment. Which 
just for show, we have come up with a fictional name called Master Myriad's Awesome Space Academy. And what we did is we took a whole heap of content or scanned documents and images that NASA released all about their, the Mars rover missions. So you'll see here, I'm sitting in a, an Azure website. If I hit search, what you'll see is it's going off and it's searching across a huge number of scanned documents and images and the AI engine in the background, one of the AI engines, is going through those documents and starting to OCR them for me to pick up where my search term um, or where my search terms actually exist within them. You'll also notice down the left hand side here, it's picking up and it's starting to build out a bit of a taxonomy and some linkages to other search terms that I might want to explore as well. Now for a slightly different view of this and will take just a moment to load up. I can start to see in real time and to click through what all of those, how all of those different search terms um, or taxonomies link together. So quickly and easily building it out as a bit of a spider's web, I can see from my initial search term, what are some of the other related terms from the taxonomy that it's identified and built out itself. Now, for a quick overview of what we're actually doing or how we're, what we're using to do this, I can quickly step you through the basic architecture that we're using. So we have a, an Azure storage blob with a huge amount of unstructured data. It's all doc, scanned documents and also images as well. We're doing using the cognitive search and OCR, handwriting, computer vision, redaction to start to pull out text, build up what those entities are and starting to create some structured knowledge around it as well, which is where we've been looking at this for. How do we, how do we use this in a real um, business context and specifically lessons learned as well? Now, some of the other things as you saw from the architecture, I can, through some of my other search terms, you'll notice it is still going off and it's going through the text and trying to do OCR, but you'll see within here, it's actually gone and been able to pick up handwriting within the image as well. Some of the other things that we then started to throw at it after playing with some of the image rec recognition was, and with Microsoft rolling some of the larger search as your search capabilities in, is things like we uploaded a bunch of pictures of Bob Hawke. After loading up a few, and it's still going off and searching scanned documents, it was actually able to work off just going across Bing search as well, that this is Bob Hawke and start to build out some other key phrases as well. Now, an interesting thing that we found was, while well, it took a few pictures of Bob Hawke, we were able to load one picture of Kim Kardashian and the AI engine was able to work out pretty quickly just based off the one that yes, this is Kim Kardashian and start to build out some of those other key phrases as well. Now, with that, I'd like to hand across to James to talk to you about some of the other AI functionality that Microsoft is rolling out into some more accessible platforms. Cool, thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, I'd like to just try and share my slides again. Uh, just bear with me in case I have some technical difficulties. But what I'd like to talk to you guys about now is a Microsoft product called Project Cortex. So Project Cortex is something that's been under wraps for a number of years now, and it's a Microsoft product that is seeking to take a lot of those services that Nathan just talked about, being object recognition, entity extraction, uh, being able to parse handwriting, etc., and being able to make that information more searchable. Uh, this isn't the first time that Microsoft has attempted to release something along these lines. Uh, way back in 2007, Microsoft did have a, a beta product 
called Knowledge Networks, and it was designed to go off and mine your the data in your inboxes, in your SharePoint sites, and in all of your other file locations to try and extrapolate some of that information and build what we refer to as a knowledge network. Now, a knowledge network is something that's new to a lot of organizations. They probably don't realize how much knowledge they actually accumulate on a day-to-day -day basis. And I know back in 2007, we did have a customer who had uh, lost a tender, uh, a bid for a tender, um, and the day after they put the tender submission in, they found out that they actually had the employee who wrote the handbook working for them in the Melbourne office. And so had they have known that they had the specialist working for them, they could have totally blitzed that submission. So this is where organizations, as they go through their digital transformation journey, start to realize that they're aggregating a lot of corporate knowledge. So helping people to understand what their corporate knowledge is, is it's, it's basically a culmination of all the information you have in your organization. Now, this could be professional information, such as white papers, reference manuals, um, communities of practice, communities of interest, where people are publishing information. It could be organizational, company-centric information, such as your org structures, your business activities that you're currently performing, your processes, and who participates in those processes. As an individual participating in those processes, you're going to be a subject matter expert. You're gonna have specific know-how about how to perform those tasks, and you're going to have a particular role to perform in the organization, along with different memberships in different communities of practice and different areas of expertise. A lot of businesses will also have ad hoc business activities such as project management, program management, or even customer jobs and things like that, where they are reasonably well-defined uh, processes, but these processes or business activities spin up and shut down on a regular basis or on an ad hoc basis. Now, going back to Nathan's point about how you manage all of this information, this is usually a very challenging situation for anybody who's in the knowledge management realm of how do you categorize and organize all of this information? How do you come up with taxonomies that allow you to categorize and tag this information in a way that makes it easy for people to find? So bearing that in mind, Microsoft is starting to move knowledge management into Microsoft 365. So some of those services that Nathan articulated earlier are going to basically be baked into the Office 365 platform in the next year or two. This is where we can enable people to continue to create and share knowledge in the usual places like Microsoft Stream, Teams, Yammer, SharePoint. And we've also got a new product that uh, I'll talk about shortly called SharePoint Spaces, which is kind of exciting. But as we build those communities and share information with each other, through your usual tools such as Teams and Outlook, we can actually have this information bubble up through the UI. So traditionally, we would spend a lot of time fine tuning the search engines to make the information discoverable, and people would have to consciously make the decision to go off and search for information. This is where Project Cortex is going to start to deliver that information up through the products that you already know and use today. So you'll have that information at your fingertips rather than having to consciously think about going off and finding that information. Project Cortex is going to provide a number of key elements that we want to discuss. Firstly, as Nathan identified, AI is great for being able to go out and categorize and organize your content, especially if you've got masses of data. So it, it's going to have a center where we can go in and we can start to identify and manage your content on a regular basis. It's going to make that job a lot easier. As part of that indexing or crawling through all of that content, Project Cortex is also going to start to extract that information out of that content and start to identify the entities within that content. So think back to Nathan's 
little spider web diagram, but imagine being able to do that across all of the content in your organization. So if you have a customer code being used in one system and a cust ID being used in a different system, Project Cortex will help to identify that that cust ID and cust code are actually the same corporate entity as in a particular customer. And it can start to pull that information together to make it easier to find all the information about that particular customer. And it's going to empower the users to be able to find and leverage that knowledge by having that information bubble up through the products that they already use. So think about Teams, think about Outlook. If somebody sends you an email referencing a particular customer ID, imagine being able to hover over that customer ID or that customer name and being able to find all the information within your organization about that particular customer. So having a look at the Project Cortex architecture, you'll see that it's sitting inside Office 365. So all of your SharePoint content, all of your Teams content, Yammer and Outlook and any other information you have stored in Office 365 will actually be ingested by Project Cortex. Project Cortex will then be able to create these little topic cards which it can then bubble up through Teams, Outlook and SharePoint to help users identify that this is something that we know about and then they can start to explore those, those topics. And this is where the topic pages come into play. So imagine if you have a very pro project centric view of the world where all your information is stored around projects. Project Cortex can actually start to identify your customers, your suppliers and any other information across all of those projects and it can start to suggest we should have a topic page for this supplier. We should have a topic page for this customer and it can start to roll up all of that information and present it on a single page. So this is where traditionally in the old SharePoint spaces, we would have a SharePoint administrator or an information manager who would curate and create that content. Now we can look to see Project Cortex fulfilling some of those roles and starting to recommend what topics we should be creating and allowing us to publish those topic pages so people can start to uh, consume information differently in your intranet. And this is where the knowledge center is also another key aspect of Project Cortex. Whoever has access to the knowledge center, we can go in and we can start to curate and identify those entities that have been extracted from our content. So being able to find out all the customers and all the partners and all the vendors and being able to manage that content moving forward. And then finally, the, the content center is also going to show us how that content is being used and how it's being processed. And this is where it gets really interesting because we can start to leverage artificial intelligence to help us auto classify and categorize that information moving forward. So looking at how that AI can help us work better together, we can use the traditional methods of manually tagging information that's already stored in our teams and in our SharePoint sites. Through going through and manually tagging that information, it's going to help feed the AI and let it understand that that's information that's important to us. The AI can also start to look at the content that we have stored in SharePoint and Teams and Outlook, and it can start to identify information stored in photos. So think back to the example Nathan provided where Columbia, the photograph of the handwritten text on the bulkhead of Columbia, we were able to identify the, the key words that were actually scrawled in human handwriting on that image. Imagine being able to store that type of content inside SharePoint or Teams and have Project Cortex be able to extract that content and make it searchable and discoverable without anybody having to do anything additional to that content. Now where it gets really exciting is in current businesses we see a lot of organizations using things like PDF forms and they refer to those forms as being things that are either scanned in or PDF and then uploaded into SharePoint for processing. What we'll be able to do with Project Cortex is through using the AI builder we'll be able to train AI models over the top of specific libraries. 
So if we created a library for storing invoices, we could train the AI to automatically recognize each document as it's uploaded, whether it's a, a TIFF, a PNG or a PDF as an invoice, and it can start to extract those key fields out of the invoice and populate the metadata on that library. This opens up huge possibilities to have workflows that once that information has been populated, we can automatically trigger a workflow for that invoice, invoice processing. So this is going to dramatically increase some of the process automation opportunities for different organizations to have AI automatically triage and categorize an invoice as it comes in to trigger a business process that then submits it to the appropriate department for approval. And then as we enhance these models, that's going to feed back into Project Cortex to make the intelligence more relevant as it evolves over time. So as your information uh, is added into the system, we can start to leverage those existing models and those existing entities that have already been extracted. Another part of Project Cortex will be the monitoring dashboards where we can start to identify the type of content that's being loaded into the system. We can then start to uh, return statistics on how well those terms and those categories are feeding the artificial intelligence and how it's increasing the benefits over time. And going back to the example where we've automated the inventory processing system, we can start to generate ROI reporting on how Project Cortex has assisted us or saved us time and therefore money in automating various processes. So that's going to be very exciting for a lot of organizations to finally start to get insights into how some of these old legacy processes are actually now starting to save them money. Now with that, I'd like to switch over and start to talk about extended reality. So when we start to talk about extended reality, we're, we're actually talking about augmented reality and virtual reality. Now, as Graham mentioned, there are some really interesting um, products starting to come out in the marketplace like Realware that extend our telecommunications capabilities to the edge of the network. And I'm starting to see that as possibly a, a, another type of augmented reality. Hopefully we're all familiar with the HoloLens and now the HoloLens 2 has also been released. Now with the HoloLens, this is Microsoft's offering in the augmented reality realms. And in the HoloLens 2 um, product lineup, we can start to see that the new enhancements on the product include increasing the field of vision. So if you do get the opportunity to try one of these devices, the increased field of view increases the immersion and the holograms now appear as though they are part of what you're looking at rather than just viewing the holograms through a small box. Some of the other improvements are 10 finger detection. So you can now use your hands and the HoloLens can actually detect your hands. And what's really interesting there is the ability to interact with some of these holograms. So you can literally pick up one hologram and look at it, move it around inside your augmented reality space. And then you can actually hand that off to another person wearing a hologram, a uh, HoloLens, and you can actually be interacting and handing another individual those holograms. The weight distribution on the new HoloLens is a lot better. So this is going to enhance the ability to wear the HoloLens for long periods of time. And we're starting to see that Microsoft has actually released the HoloLens to OEM manufacturers. And you can see here on the right, being able to add uh, PPE or industrial hard hats into the configuration. So we can now start to wear the HoloLens out in the field, out to the factory floor. One of the big mistakes we saw a lot of organizations make when the HoloLens 1 first landed is it didn't have a whole bunch of pre-baked applications available for it. So a lot of people started developing their own custom applications for it. 
The interesting thing with the HoloLens too is we're starting to see a number of commercial off-the-shelf uh, products being released for the headset. And one of the really good examples that we've seen in the marketplace is a product called Tactile. What Tactile allows you to do is it's a piece of software, so you just buy it, so you don't need to start cutting code. And once you've acquired the software and loaded it onto your headset, you can use the headset to capture knowledge out on the factory floor. So as your uh, workforce is starting to age and we're starting to churn people off the tools so they can retire, we can continue to capture their knowledge and experience through using the headset to record video tutorials. Now, you actually don't necessarily need the headset to record those tutorials. You can still use conventional um, iPads and phones to record video tutorials and then knit them back into your training plans and your operations plans. You can also consume 3D models into the, the uh, training plans to help augment the uh, work instructions and, and the tutorials that you're trying to create. And the, these products are also starting to introduce the, the ability to collaborate at the edge, as uh, Graham discussed earlier. Now, switching over and talking a little bit more about the virtual reality space, one of the things that I personally have found has been really exciting is the, the new Oculus Quest. So this has been out for a little over a year now. And I first noticed a couple of customers starting to use the Oculus Quest in some really unusual applications. I had a customer who was uh, in insurance and they actually mentioned that they were using the Oculus Quest for their case handlers. So their case handlers were dealing with some very traumatic uh, cases and they were using the Oculus Quest to give those case managers a virtual break during the day. So they can basically put on a headset and use it for meditating or going for a walk through a, a forest and just taking a break out of their traumatic day-to-day -day work. And I thought that was really interesting. So I actually acquired one of these headsets just before lockdown and I actually have found the ability of escaping into the virtual reality has been very interesting, especially at the moment where we're not allowed to leave the house. Part of the reason why the Oculus, I think, is gaining a lot of traction in the market at the moment is it's very easy to set up. It's one of the first headsets I've seen that doesn't require any other room sensors. You can literally walk in with the headset, plonk it down on a table, and within five to ten minutes you can have it up and running and have somebody immersed in a, uh, a 3D space or a 3D environment. It's also wireless and it's portable. Now, one of the really exciting applications I see with the Oculus Quest, Microsoft a few months ago released something called SharePoint Spaces. Now, SharePoint Spaces, when you initially look at it, is just a SharePoint site, but it allows us to interact with content in a, a completely different way. So I have this short video I'd like to play and you can see I'm currently wearing the headset and I'm looking at a SharePoint site. So nothing really revolutionary at this point except for the fact that I'm looking at a website through a headset. And you can see all the traditional lists and libraries are available. I do have a web part on the home page that has a whole bunch of content on it. And down in the bottom right hand corner you can see a headset button. When I click the headset button I'm dropped into the 3D environment. I can still consume videos in that 3D environment as I would normally. So I can watch a video on how to do something. I can also bring in documents and I can read them within the environment. If I need to, I can push that out to be a full screen uh, document if I wanted to read it. But where it gets really exciting is the ability to bring 3D models into this space. And you can see as I tilt my head, I can be looking around and looking at the 3D object. But even better, I can now grab it and pick it up and move it around as though it's just a toy. So I can look at it from different angles. I can put it back on the pedestal and then rotate it so I can look at it from different angles. And you can see I can be interacting with the object. And when I'm done, I just click on it and it returns to the pedestal. Over on the right, you'll notice that there are some 3D videos. This is where it gets really interesting. 
I can now click on a 3D video and I can be immersed in the 3D video as though I was in the pit with the F1 team. So now not only can I be playing with the objects, but I can be immersed in a new, video, new 3D video that would literally be me sitting in the cockpit of an F1. Now, I probably won't let the full video play as it goes out on the track, but you can imagine this is a very interesting way of being able to show somebody what it's like to actually be in that environment. So I might just pause that video. If you're interested, hit us up later on and we can show you that video in a bit more detail or even a, a, a live demo. So in summary, I hope you guys have seen how Teams has been underpinning the new way of working. We've discussed a number of different ways that we can see AI being used in the workplace. We can see that VR is becoming more and more um, utilized in the workplace, and especially now with border shutdowns, how can we actually be sharing those experiences over distances? And we're hoping that this all comes back to you looking after your own documents and managing your content in your organization more effectively. Now, we do actually have uh, the Q&A uh, enabled on this session, so feel free to post any questions in the Q&A. And at that, I'd like to open the floor for any questions. And we have uh, Chris moderating for us, so he will uh, take questions now and feel free to post them and we'll probably get the appropriate person to answer the question depending on what they are. Alrighty, so we do have a question here. Um, so I think this one's for you, Graham. Uh, what is involved with migrating to Teams? So thanks for that. It can be as simple as just turning it on. Um, so Teams is there now. It's if to get it set up out of the box is literally just turning it on and logging in there, setting up a team site and away you go. Uh, if you're talking about migrating and transitioning from say a SharePoint environment to Teams, it, again, there can be the simple path of simply linking your SharePoint site and involving content over time. Um, or it can be, you know, building up a, a bit of a, deploying a custom template and reassigning that data. And again, it's designed in a way that can yeah, with a bit of professional help to get it set up right, is then 100% self-managed and maintained. So, um, yeah, th th that's what I'd say. It's pretty much out of the box, and it depends on how customised you'd like it to be. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for that. Um, so next question. Um, can the AI be used for digitised documents to identify type, for example, invoices and purchase orders? I'm happy to take that one. Um, I think that's actually I'll take that one, Chris. So <laughs> yes, um, we have one of our initial tests was could we train an AI engine to analyze just a, a huge set of basically PDFs and Word documents? Um, I can't remember the specific stats, but it was it wasn't a massive amount before we were able to pick up the difference between an invoice, a purchase order, and then things like contracts and the different type of contracts as well. Where we see it going in the future is things like as invoices, purchase orders, contracts um, are received via things like email and brought into Outlook. Um, things like Project Cortex being able to not just work out that, hey, this is an invoice, but start to pick up some of the key detail associated with it as well. Things like dollar values, um, vendor codes, line items and things like that. Yeah, so just, just to add on to that, the when we we're using some of the Azure services to classify documents, we were seeing a pretty high success rate, even with just some initial training and some um, relatively small subset of data, we were able to get an 80% accuracy of being able to recognize a, a purchase order from an invoice and, and identifying the different types of data, uh, document types. 
Awesome. Uh, we have another question here. So can you see people moving away from SharePoint to access content and moving to Teams, particularly with the new lists feature? Graham, I think that'd be for you. So yes, um, like just remembering that Teams is built on SharePoint. It is effectively the same platform underpinning it and it's really putting it in the user's hand. So SharePoint is still the underpinning technology and will still have a place, especially when we start talking about some of the advanced things we're talking about uh, with the SharePoint spaces and all those sorts of things. So I think SharePoint will move into a new dimension, but uh, on a day to day basis, I think you will see a, a strong lean towards Teams um, simply for the fact that it can be self managed and just reduce that technical overhead. Awesome. Thank you, Graham. All right, James is just going to quickly say something. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, just thinking on, yeah, that, that's a common misconception around uh, understanding how Teams and SharePoint fit together. And, and as Graham mentioned, you know, underpinning Teams is Microsoft SharePoint. So we don't see SharePoint going away anytime soon. Um, what I'm starting to see with a lot of our customers is depending on how you want to interact with your information, if you do still want a traditional intranet or document management system, you can access those repositories through SharePoint. But if you want something a little bit more dynamic and collaborative, then you've still got the Teams uh, interface over the top to make it a little bit more collaborative. Now, I think we're going to wrap up. So what I'd like to do is as a call to action, if you're not already in Office 365, start looking at how you can migrate to Office 365 today. Uh, Graham gave us a really good overview of a number of the new Teams features which are either already out or literally coming out shortly. Start exploring some of those opportunities to use AI in your organization today. And with things like uh, Project Cortex coming out, start considering running a pilot. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for coming along to today's webinar. And if there's been anything of interest in this session, please feel free to reach out and contact us and we'd be more than happy to continue the discussion. Thank you very much, everybody.